Um, hello, I'm Jennings, and today um, I'm with University of Colorado Boulder and a research fellow at Mapbox, and uh, today I'm going to talk about this work that's done collaboratively between the two. So, uh, let's jump right in here. Let's start with this rendering of the global road network in OSM. What can this tell us about the map? We know broadly uh, we have global coverage. The differences in colors here show us that we have very different levels of consistency and completeness across the globe. Uh, these are two very common measures of map quality. So let's start an assessment of this. Is this map complete? Or is this map complete? The mapper in us all knows this is a pretty loaded, problematic term that requires much further definition. How about good quality? Is the map of good quality? Even more interpretations and completeness, quality can always improve, and assessing map quality can take many forms, as we just saw. So I propose a different question here, kind of a reframing. How has the map grown and evolved over time? Completeness and quality are contained somewhere inside this complex relationship, so let's try to explore that. Quality assessment is complicated. What's special about OSM, however, is that it's not a single static geospatial data set. It's constantly evolving and growing. With time, then, comes improvement in quality at, at a large scale. Um, and this is especially fun with OSM data because it's kind of opposite of some other geospatial data sets that, with time, grow old and stale, and we need to have them updated separately. So here's a very general kind of rendering of this is what we should see. This is what we expect to see in the community as the map grows. So to this end, we're performing an intrinsic quality analysis of OSM data with respect to growth over time. As such, we do not rely on external reference data sets, but we're rather assessing OSM data in relation to itself and with regard to this growth over time. These are some of the attributes of the map that we'll be exploring. Contributor information here refers to the specific user ID associated with an edit uh, to an object on the map. We can then count the users, see when users are active, and even identify specific types of edits per the user. For example, did they change the object's name? Did they add a speed limit? For map objects, we ask questions about their type, count, and relative density. So let's dive right into the guts here. These assessments are all based on vector tiles. This allows us to use the tile reduce framework for efficient parallel processing of the map data. TileReduce is an open source MapReduce framework that's based on vector tiles. So first we turn OSM data into vector tiles, creating a global tile set rendered at zoom level 12 of the entire OSM database. This is the same process that generates the daily OSM quality assurance tiles. These tile sets contain about two and a half million tiles for the whole world. We create a tile set that represents a snapshot of the map at every three months over the past 11 years to achieve this quarterly resolution of the map's history. For example, here's Boulder at this quarterly resolution. The top row shows growth over the first three quarters during the rapid um, growth of the US map during the Tiger import. And then this bottom row shows growth in the last five years as the buildings have been added to the map, filling it in. So each map object uh, in these tiles contains the following attributes. These attributes give us an idea of when it was last edited, by who, and most importantly, tell us what it is. So this particular object is that field. One thing the quarterly snapshots cannot tell us, however, is exactly how specific objects evolve over time. We know that Folsom Field has been edited three times, but we do not know how each of these versions changed it. For this, we need something new, the historical vector tile set. So from the full history planet dump, we create a new tile set that has complete tag history for individual map objects. For map objects that have a version greater than one, there's then an additional attribute called history that tracks changes to tags per version. So for example, here's the same history of this stadium. We can see here that it was first added to the map in 2013 with just the two tags, sport and leisure. A couple months later, someone came in, a different user came in and added the new tag for the name, Folsom Field. And then just last year, another tag went on to show that it is um, the uh, actual grass field. So we've developed a scalable method to create these histories and generate a tag history tile set that's currently able to run for all of North America, which represents about 20% of the entire OSM history database. Um, 
is able to run for all of North America in just a few hours on a fairly modest server. Uh, so we're able to, to scale it. Um, this process uses the Osmium library as well as Facebook's RocksDB persistent key value store to create a massive history index and then reconstructs these per object histories from said index while rendering the tile set. Uh, I'd really love to talk more about this process after this session. Uh, it's a topic I've put a lot of thought into. I know a lot of others in here share this interest. So here's another example of tag history, this time a tennis court in San Francisco. In this highlighted edit here in the, in the middle, in April 2010, the tag describing the number of courts was added, and then the tag created by Potlatch was deleted from the object itself. So these historical tiles sets track new, deleted, and modified tags across all previous versions of objects. So now we have multiple tile sets to feed our analysis, object histories and quarterly snapshots. First, we aggregate these data at zoom 15. This means roughly one square kilometer resolution. These results are then represented by point geometries, as you can see here on these various dots. And then these stats are rendered to zoom level 12 tiles, which then have 64 individual features per tile. And this is all done just to optimize this process uh, for tile reduce. So now for the analysis pipeline. Using tile reduce, we specify multiple tile sets as our input. Currently, we have the object histories and the quarterly snapshots. This approach could easily scale to incorporate more sources such as population data for normalization or reference data set for a more traditional extrinsic quality assessment through comparison to an authoritative source. So then for each tile, we calculate various attributes such as kilometers of named highway, number of contributors, what's the distribution of work by those contributors within these tiles, and this is where we could also then normalize by population or compare to reference data if we, incorpor if we incorporated those data sets. For each tile that's processed, results are then returned at the Zoom 15 resolution, and these are continually aggregated down all the way to Zoom level eight. A lot goes into this particular process to keep it memory efficient. Another detail I'd be happy to get more into offline. The final result here then is a series of GeoJSON files representing these tile stats at these various Zoom levels. Finally, we feed these data back into Tippy Canoe to create final aggregate tile sets with statistics for the given editing quarter. We repeat this process for every quarter since 2007, generating a series of tile sets that contain information about every edit occurring within each quarter and the subsequent state of the map at the end of the quarter. This is imperative to tell the complete story of how the map has really come to be. The features in these tile sets are then not specific objects, but rather geometries that represent the tile and are organized by zoom level. I also want to mention here that we choose to go this route with vector tiles as our main data store for a couple reasons. First, they're just single files. We're not maintaining a database uh, and, and tracking that. And at any given point with vector tiles, at any part of this uh, pipeline, we can then just easily render that data and visualize it and have an idea and, of, of what we're looking at and see that data in spatial context. So now we use Mapbox GL to render these tile sets in the browser to do visual analysis. So this enables us to then both style and query these data uh, by these calculated attributes. So here's a visualization of where new kilometers of highway were added to the map, as opposed to editing uh, kilometers of existing highway. This is just creation of highways. The colors on the map show where this mapping occurred during the fourth quarter of 2007. This was the bulk of the Tiger import. The small graph up there on the right-hand side shows the average of each render tile over all of the quarters. And you can see we're looking at the spike here. So referring to this graph, we know that this quarter was the busiest. Beyond seeing that a few states were not added during this quarter, this rendering reiterates the well-known story of the Tiger import. So we can use kind of our familiarity with this story to help validate this approach. Um, and now we know it's, it's working. So then zooming in and out, we see the different levels of aggregation all the way down to the Zoom 15 level tile. Each of these features is then packed with statistics about both the individual editing activity for the quarter, such as kilometers of new road, as well as the broader statistics of what the state of the map was at the end of this quarter. If we now change the map to instead show the number of active users per quarter, we should not be surprised to see that during this final quarter of 2007, there were very few users. In fact, mostly just one or two, uh, the import accounts. But the bar graph on the right shows that the number of users active per quarter has certainly grown over time. And we can see that in this room as well. We can, we can then compare over time to see the specific differences across the map. 
Here we see the editing community's growth and their relative locations over the last five years. This could be greatly improved by normalizing with results, uh, normalizing these results by population, uh, something that we're currently working on. But in general, we can see um, that we have growth. If we instead just count all map edits to the last quarter, we see decent national coverage of the continental US. The detail graph on the right highlights periods of mass edits and imports then with each of those spikes. So just a reminder, these are all calculated in the browser based on Zoom level eight aggregations of the data that was originally calculated at Zoom 15. And if we zoom in, we can access all that Zoom 15 level data. So digging deeper into these edits, let's now look specifically at buildings. Looking at the number of new buildings added to the map as calculated from the full history, the bar graph on the right shows the first significant spike in the US map to be 2013 with relatively sustained activity since. So we render that map for that quarter of 2013 and we see that dark spot and we zoom in and we find this was the Massachusetts import. Recalculating for this region, we see that most of the new building activity was here in 2013 and we've seen this new resurgence in 2017. So uh, now if instead we focus on the last two years of just new buildings, we can see a few major building imports taking place. Notably the LA building import stands out dramatically. There. Zooming in and then switching to building density, we can do a comparison at that Zoom 15 resolution for the first half of 2016, the time of that LA building import. Querying over time, we then see what we would expect, that the, there is just dramatic growth in LA building density in the last two years. So let's switch gears now and look a little bit more closely at users. One day I'm gonna have to stop using this example, uh, but this particular data set and the familiarity of the story makes this example such a good case uh, study for these types of analyses. But here we're comparing number of users active per quarter in Haiti between the last quarter of 2009 and the first quarter of 2010 when the earthquake struck. And then here's, an here's the result of the building density improvement over that time. Zooming back out and then rather than per quarter, let's look at just the total number of unique contributors to date in 2012 compared to the total number of unique contributors to date as of last quarter. I like this one especially because 2012 does not look too bad. There's a lot of uh, unique contributors all over the US to date, um, and then 2017 just blows that out of the water. So what's next? Where do we go with this? So two things here, a gold standard tile set and, two, and historical geometries. So far, uh, we've shown that relative growth and um, computed specific completeness attributes, uh, we can show that over time. Um, we can show relative differences between regions and identify, identify areas that need to be improved uh, or show areas that have progressed faster than others. The next step is to then qualify what these differences might be. To do that, we're developing a gold standard data set through qualitative evaluation of the map by expert users to create a reference data set for this type of direct comparison. From this data set, we can then perform better feature extraction and learn what indicators best describe things like map quality, completeness, coverage, with respect to growth and location over time. So yes, I am hinting a little bit here at machine learning. For each Zoom 15 tile, like the one shown here, a mapper then assesses the following dimensions on a five-point scale. Each tile is assessed by multiple experts. And here's an example uh, of building coverage. On the left, we see two tiles that are rated as five stars with regards to coverage. Um, building density is obviously different between the two given their urban and rural landscapes, and therefore we can see that building density is probably gonna be a bad indicator of coverage on its own. So this is something that we want to understand this complex relationship more. The two tiles on the right, however, are rated at only two stars because we can clearly see buildings that are not yet mapped. So kind of in sum on that, there is no single attribute that can predict or define completeness or quality for the map. We know there are areas with more data than others and we can see how this balance changes between regions. The understatement of the day is then the relationship between these attributes and map quality is complex. 
However, developing this gold standard tile set gives us something to compare to and gets us one step closer to defining this complex relationship. More specifically, developing this supervised expert data set will help design machine classifiers that will help us better understand these complex relationships. Lastly, historical geometries. Here's a snapshot of some new buildings, version one, added to the map in Nepal the week following the 2015 earthquake. Here's that same map 10 days later. Did you see the change? These buildings are all still version one in the database. Let's look closer. 10 days before, keep an eye on these buildings specifically. They're all square. Still version one, but all square. So the geometries were changed because the nodes were moved. Another user came in, squared up all these buildings, and this was something that we saw happen in Nepal and created some frustration uh, with the more experienced community uh, that new users were not creating square buildings. Um, our current tools struggle to track this change in geometry because it doesn't actually iterate the version number of the building, rather just moves the nodes around. So our full history approach is able to resolve these changes and create tile sets that can be explored along this dimension as well. And so we're currently building on that. So with that, thank you. I'll take a, hopefully one or two questions. And here's a screen capture of interacting with this full history uh, geometry uh, tile set that we're working with. 